Let's talk a little bit more about blood glucose because uh, you've mentioned that a few times and you know a, a staggeringly high number of people have type 2 diabetes. There are many people with pre-diabetes. Uh, I'm interested in how time-restricted eating can be utilized as a tool to help better blood glucose control. So what's the kind of relationship between um, the time of the day, our meal, and blood glucose control? And um, as an extension of that, perhaps you could speak to um, something that Emily and Courtney also spoke to, which is this idea of early time-restricted eating versus late time-restricted eating when it comes to, to blood glucose control. And if someone has prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, what are some of the things that they um, should be thinking about here? Yeah, so that's a very loaded question. So <laughs> I will, <laughs> I'll break it down. So um, you know, when we think of circadian rhythm, we always think of connecting it to sleep, but actually circadian rhythms are much more intimately re uh, related to blood glucose, the regulation of blood glucose, cholesterol, and fat. And um, let's begin with uh, what happens, how all of these are connected. And this is very important because as you mentioned, nearly half of the adults in Western countries, particularly in the US, UK, Australia, are either pre-diabetic or diabetic, uh, type 2 diabetic. And uh, this trend is also going up. So that means what we are doing um, as, a, as a society is something is very fundamentally wrong. And that may be this uh, eating randomly over a long period of time. Um, so as I said, in the morning, for example, when as soon as we wake up, if we eat, then at that time, our pancreas is not ready to assimilate food in a way um, that our blood glucose remains healthy. Uh, one thing we have to keep in mind that we always say um, some diet is rich in protein, diet is rich in fat, but the bottom line is almost all food that we eat has some carbohydrate, uh, unless you are just eating pure oil or pure uh, meat, uh, but for most of us, it contains some carbohydrates. So that's why avoiding meal for at least an hour or two in the morning will help um, in preparing our body, particularly our pancreas, to respond to that carbohydrate uh, in a healthy way um, in the morning. And the second is circadian rhythm research is also showing that the pancreas is much better in responding to food and secreting good amount of insulin to control our blood glucose, uh, say two hours after waking up to for the next six to seven hours or eight hours. So that means right. eating a good big meal in the first half of the day mm -hmm. is much better in controlling blood glucose because our digestive system and, in, and pancreas are better in handling uh, big meal. I think that's a... a a, a really important point, sorry, Sachin, just to reiterate okay. something there. Um, given the number of people with poor blood glucose control that could benefit from this as a tool, um, I think this is worth kind of double-clicking on because if you think about, say, intermittent fasting or the standard sort of eight-hour protocol that became very popular, I know in speaking to a lot of people that that many people did a sort of midday to 8 p.m. style eating window, but from what you're saying, um, if you're wanting to get improvements in blood glucose control and if that's something that you're struggling with, it might be more beneficial to kickstart that eating window slightly earlier than that. Yeah, but not too early. That Right after you wake up, you should start eating. So have that two hours uh, wait time after waking up mm -hmm. and then try to eat um, around um, 9 or 10 in the morning mm -hmm. if you can or if you're waking up too early, maybe even mm -hmm. 8 o'clock is okay. Um, then there's another aspect that we often forget is, okay, so let's work on the end of the day. So what happens is for most of us, um, our body begins to prepare for sleep by producing melatonin two to three hours before our bedtime. So that means uh, if I'm going to bed around, say habitually around eight, 10 o'clock at night, then my body starts making melatonin uh, at eight in the evening. 
So melatonin, uh, for some, for nearly half of, half of the population, melatonin actually inhibits insulin release from pancreas. So that means if someone, if I have my dinner at seven o'clock and my blood glucose is still high, my pancreas is kicking to produce enough insulin to bring that blood glucose low, then insulin, eh, sorry, melatonin comes in and inhibits that process so that um, my blood glucose can stay high for um, several minutes or even an hour or two longer. So that's why having your last meal three hours before, at least three hours before bedtime is a pretty good idea so that you, uh, your body can um, kind of use that glucose without raising glucose, blood glucose too high. Would that mean, Sachin, um, sort of continuing that train of thought there, um, would, would that therefore mean if you're a shift worker and you are eating overnight, that it would be better through that shift to be around bright light so that you don't get that increase in, in melatonin as you're then eating those meals? Yeah, so if you're a shift worker and you want to, and your shift is ending, say, 7 or 8 in the morning and you're coming back home at 9, so then um, your, again, your last meal should be um, say around 4 to 6 o'clock in the morning so that you give yourself 3 to 4 hours, come back and have a nice dark room where you can sleep. And as you said, enough light so that melatonin remains low. 